any of the library stuff, me and John Chamberlain did the ranked choice vote. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, we'll test. We'll, we'll test the Zoom people. You know where where you vote good afternoon everyone can the people on zoom hear me i try to knock out the zoom issues at the beginning of these things because it makes you all happy and laugh but also the people on zoom just happy Or, can you can you just go into the chat if you're on Zoom and type in hi or digital or preservation or, or whatever, but, but we're gonna keep it keep it nice. Well, but chat is disabled, but they were able to QA it. That is awesome. That's great. So we will be using just just we will be using the QA function at the latter part of the moderated session. Um, I've got a series of this, but before we get into that, good afternoon, everyone, or if you're across the world, whatever time of the day it is, I hope you're having a good day. Um, my name is John Shaw. I'm the university librarian here at Vanderbilt. It's really great to be with you. This program today and tomorrow is exceptional. I have looked at it and we must start with a round of applause for Elizabeth. This is just, this is wonderful. These these really are the conversations that we need to have around digital preservation. Jim Duran and the crowd and I were um, giving a talk last week at the Amazon's AWS Imagine conference. And we talked about, of course, digital preservation. And the thing that got back to us at the end of that is that's so pragmatic. Why are you guys so pragmatic? That's wonderful. And I'm like, everything that we've been doing in this space, in this sphere of thinking about digital preservation, is about how do we preserve this thing in perpetuity? And looking at, um, my, I'm joined by Paul Conway, Professor Emeritus from the School of Information at Michigan, and Tim Gollins, our Director of Special Collections here at Vanderbilt. When I'm looking at both Paul and Tim's work, that's what it is. It's about doing this work in practice. So I'm, I'm really happy to moderate the session. I've got some really interesting questions that I'm curious to see what they're going to do. I'm going to stay on script at the beginning because I told Tim I would at least give him one question that he knew was coming. But after that, <laughs> after that, when, who knows? Choose my own adventure. And I hope you all can benefit from that in some ways because we're going to ask about what we're interested in in this sphere. So the first one to both of you. The notion of the technical, material, and archival expertise needed to curate and digitize audiovisual resources. Tell me how acquired, you know, by my own expertise and what, what are some of the limitations that you face when you're building a digital archive? Recognize like, what is the, what, when do you seek outsourcing for things as opposed to what do you do in-house? So the, the question really is, when do you use your own expertise in building a digital archive? And when do you look for external expertise? And the, my one spin I will ask on this, when do you look for partnerships? Because listening to the morning keynote this morning, it was a lot about building that partnership. Mm -hmm. So over to our two experts. Want to go first? Well, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I've had the good fortune in my, I retired uh, two years ago. And after 44 years of continuous growth in the archives and library profession. And I feel very fortunate about that. There's many reasons that people don't have such a long thing. Looking back, it looks linear. Looking going forward, it looks serendipitous and opportunistic. And um, when it comes to digital imaging, which is my was my first technical, I came out, I was trained as an archivist and worked as an archivist, processing collections and doing reference service and building exhibits for about a decade or so. And then um, I'm not going to 
run through my whole career, but there was a moment when I was working at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., for a variety of reasons. I got married and my wife said, well, um, I'm going to go work at the Library of Congress. If we're going to get married, um, you probably would like to come to Washington too, right? So I got into the National Archives and I was doing a user study. It's published and because uh, that was my original expertise. But at one point, the people I was working for were, thought it should be done. We know enough about users now. And, um, and what, they, what my bosses said was, um, we want you to look into this newfangled digital imaging uh, industry that is already well embedded in the corporate sector and is increasingly embedded in the governmental sector because one of these days this stuff is going to land at the National Archives and we want to know what is happening. And I was a user study guy, but um, um, I went along, I was told to do it, and I spent a year um, visiting government agencies. I didn't know anything about digital imaging, but I went to the um, conferences, the professional conferences, um, the trade conferences, read a lot, but mostly just wandered around and asked a lot of questions, initially stupid ones, but once you ask the same question and get different answers three times, it becomes a good question. And so the, coming out the other end of the year, not only did I know something about this um, I was able to produce a viable report for the National Archives and, um, and, and for the rest, next 35 years, thank the people that suggested I do something that I didn't want to do. So I think technically you can learn a lot by, by giving it enough time and energy. Um, you don't have to have been programming since you were in sixth grade or um, have a, your own digitization set up at home. So I think some of it is just having good mentors and good being in the right place at the right time and being willing to dig into it. Um, and then the second half of the question is, what are your limitations? And um, I am not a, a, a programmer, but what I learned fairly early on is the, uh, the power of having uh, friends who know something, whether it's a plumber or an electrician on one hand, or whether it's somebody that knows how to run a, a load software on a server. So um, initially it was just friends in high places. And then later it was because I was supervising or running programs. Then it's how do you hire people? How do you know uh, how to hire someone that can fill in a gap that you don't know uh, and, and have your ego enough in check that you can respect somebody else's knowledge and manage that work without actually knowing the work yourself. So um, I, I, I think it's largely attitudinal um, rather than technical. Um, and that's a barrier for people, I think, that they don't think they can know it, so they don't. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But it was a lot of it was mentorship and and um, opportunities um, to to take on something that was. I tell my students to lean into your discomfort, and it. A lot of building a career is just learn, leaning into your discomfort, and I did a lot of that. Thank you. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different take on your on the question, if that's all right. I'm very conscious of our audience. Uh, we've got a lot of people from perhaps smaller institutions out in our audience, um, particularly on Zoom. So I'm, I'm going to go for the sort of in-source, out, outsource partnering aspect oh, of, 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 of where you're asking there, John. So I think the most important thing for an institution to do, and indeed an individual to do, is to take an honest look at yourself and say, what's actually our core expertise? What's the thing that we do that is unique? That's the thing you keep to yourself. The thing that you think you can buy, that you look out in the world out there and you go, oh, there's 14 different organizations that do that and they'll charge me for the pleasure of making use of their services. You find the cheapest, find the best and the cheapest and you go with them to do those things. And when you can't find somebody out there who sells something or you can't afford it, you find a friend, partner, <laughs> who wants to play with you and is interested too. And that, that would be but the, the, the start of it, the core of it is a, an honest look at yourself and say, what are we actually good at? And so, yes, there is something about leaning into your discomforts, but I think there's also something about saying, do you know, ma no, do you know what, no matter how hard we try, we are never going to be that good at the thing. Um, web archiving is a classic where I've worked. Um, a lot of libraries do their, do their own web archiving. 
A lot of archives don't. A lot of archives go, do you know what? That's a really geeky thing. It's going to cost us a lot of money to employ geeks who are really, really good at this. Do you know what? There's a company over there. They'll do it for us. We'll pay them. And it works like a dream. When you, if, you, if you pick that, if you, if you play that just right, it's incredibly economically efficient and incredibly beneficial. That's great. Switching gears a little. So the great thing that I see with AV is once it's digitized, you can access it from pretty much everywhere. But the majority of the content has not been digitized and is very machine dependent. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of those machine dependencies coming from a place that had both Betamax tapes and laser discs and a variety of things from records to CDs? Talk about the issues of those machine dependencies and how to strategize around making it as accessible as possible prior and post digitization. Well, I can't speak a lot to AV in my own experience because the institutions I've worked at previously have not been big AV institutions. They've been national archives and their focus is largely on paper type records rather than AV type records. Um, but I have seen some work that the BBC were doing in the UK. And at the end of the day, it's the standard archival selection and appraisal problem. You have to, you have to get good archivists to look at the material, understand the collection, and put it in some sort of priority order. Because there isn't enough money, and there isn't enough equipment, and there isn't enough life left in that equipment to actually convert every piece of AV that's out there that we won't want to convert in principle into digital. Um, and this was brought home to me when I visited the BBC. Um, they were using, I can't remember, uh, Umatic, I think was the, was, the name of the, was the name of the tape format. And they had a massive archive of Umatic tapes of all their stuff. The stuff that I happened to see was um, wall-to-wall -wall recordings of, of British um, political party conferences. Not exactly stunning viewing, I have to say. Um, but, you know, um, and we were talking and they said, yep, we've got, they have these racks of machines. I said, yeah. I said, and I, they said, of course, there isn't enough head life in these, in, in, in these types of machines in the world because they knew how long the heads, when the heads wore out, they said, there's not enough head life for us to get through that pile. Doesn't matter what we do, the machines, are, the, the machines aren't made anymore, the heads aren't made anymore, there's not enough head life left. So we will have to, we will have to choose. And that's, that's the reality of it for me, that with all archiving, with all of our work, you have to make a hard choice. You've got a fixed budget of either money, time, or head life, or whatever, what are you going to do with your fixed budget? Um, I, I have probably three or four sound bites that I can utter in, in quick succession about audiovisual. Um, one is um, a, a collection care, um, extending the life of these machine dependent uh, resources um, for perhaps new technological extraction process to come along, like um, Irene that can do discs now with laser with a, with, without um, intervention. Hmm. So I think um, um, a, a deep um, commitment by libraries and cultural heritage to high grade preservation storage is, is job number one. The second, building on Tim's idea of appraisal, the, uh, the flip side of that is accepting benign neglect, accepting loss, that things are oh, yeah. lost. So Completely. We, can go with, we can go with that. And then um, the, um, my third sound bite is, is uh, digitize first and worry about access later. And I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago, but we can now keep the bits and we can document the bits. It's part of the digital preservation thing. So yep. plow ahead, whether it's through third party contractors or in-house factories that you build, depending on what you do yeah, well yeah. or not. Absolutely. So, uh, but digitize, digitize, digitize based on your best sense of what's the most important stuff. Yep. And then without playing it first because you can't play you it. You haven't got time to yeah. play it. And then the, 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 my final soundbite is we need to do a whole lot better job of engineering demand because um, user demand 
of all sorts, whether it's entertainment, like I talked about this morning, or deep scholarship in innovative ways, or um, HBO that wants clips for something and is willing to pay for it. Um, um, I think that we need to let people know we have this stuff, which is the uh, at a level of detail that people can decide whether they're going to demand it or not. So that's list making and uh, website, uh, pushing your metadata out into the open web and all kinds of things like that. But I think in the end, what's gonna be saved is what is used. And that yep. it, use doesn't just happen. It has to be, Absolutely. we have to create it I mean, in our own way. The, the uh, Blue Ribbon Task Force um, on digital preservation. Yeah, Digital preservation is an economic problem. It yes. is not fundamentally, it's not a technical problem. It is an economic problem. Right. That it is an economic driver. If yeah. if it's gonna if it, if there is a need for it, and need equals cash, then right. it will survive. Yeah. And on the digital side, once it's already digital, the yeah. I was talking to a, a couple of people in, in small groups, and mm -hmm. we 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 librarians and archivists may have to embrace the delete key. Yeah. Um, because perversely, scarcity. There's no such thing as scarcity right now. So we and can engineer demand on the one side and we can engineer a certain amount of, of scarcity. Well, sorry, we weren't able to preserve that or no one used that collection of digital bits uh, that took up five terabytes ever <laughs> um, in the last 10 years. Yep. So, um, so, so the other thing I would say is um, I completely agree with yeah. digitize as fast as you can, as yep. much as you can, and don't worry about, mm -hmm. don't worry about access. What I would say is don't, don't just digitize without thinking about the preservation right. of those bits, right? Because the preservation of those bits is not, it's not trivial. It's not hideously difficult. It's not free. It, and it's not free. So understand before you start where you're going with that and have a plan. And it doesn't have to be a sophisticated plan. It just yeah. needs to be a plan. Yeah. About um, 25 years ago, I wrote a paper that gets cited, and I a lot, and it was preservation in the digital world. And one of the sound bites that came out of that piece is, is that we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this stuff in 1998 if we had a medium like microfilm and a format um, like microfilm that you could drop stuff, put it in a cave, and forget about it. I would love to have Dead Sea Scrolls discovered 3,000 years from now, digital D Dead Sea Scrolls, but somebody has to make that happen. Uh, and the reason we got microfilm is the Cold War and nuclear Armageddon. We yeah. had to be able to compress the information in a space where we could hide it in a cave when the big one drops. So what's the big one? Is it climate change? Is it something? But something big like that has to motivate a, a search for a, a, a media storage system that doesn't require electricity. It doesn't require constant attention. Um, it doesn't require X, Y, and Z. And if we can figure that out, then a lot of the angst that we've experienced for the last 20 years will just simply evaporate. Well, and I, I want to, I love the idea of digitize first. And, and I've been hearing a lot more of that recently. And I think let's unpack it from a very practical realm. Um, what is it that you need to do in terms of describing just for minimal access? How do you describe or what would you go about describing? But also this allows us to go into machine learning and AI for building on that description and looking at it as you can describe this over a continuum. It's not something that you need to describe right now. Now, yeah. this has a really nice corollary in Tim, your work in parsimonious preservation yeah. where you preserve now. And you continue preserving over time. That's right. Exactly. I think I think the future of like description it. and access. It's the same model. Falls on the same model. Yeah. So can talk a little great. bit about parsimonious preservation. Mm -hmm. And Paul, I'd love to hear how that bridges mm -hmm. into access. So um, back in 2009, there was an awful lot of talk about some very sophisticated um, models for preservation. Uh, the OAS model being the the, the one it, the the one that gets trotted out. Um, and um, much like our colleagues who are on Zoom, who I understand many of which are from small institutions, um, they take a look at these complex things and kind of go, ah! right? Terrifying, because if the, the model itself is that big. Yeah. Imagine how big the computer is that, 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 that builds on it. And the people that wrote it 
actually they were rocket scientists. Yeah, that's right. Quite literally rocket scientists. So, so how on earth is a lone arranger, if I can use that expression, gonna 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 deal with that stuff? So um, I sat back and I kind of went, ah, do you know what? Let's look at what we're trying to do here. We're trying to keep bits. Okay. Okay, well, that's actually the IT industry, the IT world has solved that problem. They solved it decades ago. It's called a hard drive, actually. Um, and there's lots of absolutely off the shelf technology that every single IT department in every single institution in the world was using then and is using now. What you need to look at is what are the properties of that system that they've got and how you tweak them a bit. And uh, it's, I think it's, I think they call it three, two, one, three copies, two distinct risk environments, one copy offline. Mm -hmm. There you go. You've kept the bit safe. Don't do, do anything else. You've kept the bit safe. The other bit is know what you've got. So you make a list. That's how you know what you've got. You make a list. And you know what? There's little bits of software out there who will make the list, that will make the list for you. Just point them at the pile of bits and go, make me a list. And it will make you a list. You've done the job, at least to a level. Now, you haven't got access, but you've got a list. And you've got as much as you can pull out at that. Oh, what's happened to me? Something happened there with my voice. I suddenly don't went funny. Um, you've got enough information at that list level to start thinking about handing it over to the access person who can start to think about building on that list. And once you've got the list, you can pull the object out and you can throw it to your AI. You can throw it to your fancy piece of kit and you can start to learn about it. And then you can layer up on top of that. So today we've got ChatGPT. I know you didn't want to mention ChatGPT. You had the thing about ChatGPT, so I thought I'd throw it in there. Um, we've got ChatGPT. Back when I was learning computing, we had Prolog and Expert Systems. Right? That was the latest AI. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. The point is that the technology has moved on in ways that today we cannot imagine. So the idea that we would analyze a stream of bits that we preserved today, create a description or create some knowledge, some descriptions, not quite the word, create some intelligence about that, um, those bits. Um, and that's the only thing we ever do. And that stays the same forever. That's madness, it's clearly madness. Because in two years time, some new piece of technology is gonna come on that is gonna be a, do a better job of analyzing those bits. So let's build our world such that we can layer description upon description upon description upon description so that we build up a, a multifaceted, multi-layered view of our collections. And we don't need to use fancy tech to do it. We just keep the bits, go and get the object. Oh, there's that free service there on the internet. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, you've told me the keywords that are in there. Thank you, I'll just put that in my little database. Right, next job. Oh, there's another one. Yeah. That's it. And if we're doing the digital preservation piece right, which is still an open question, we, yes. have, we, we buy time. That, it's, a, um, it's all about buying time. Um, it's about and we, and again, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have thought about everything was in a panic over, yep. uh, over loss, but um, uh, it, it's it's sort of a joke. We haven't lost anything. No, nothing's been lost. It, it, it's it's still out there floating around. I mean, yeah. occasionally, and when you do hear of loss, you you hear the horror story. It's like the rule by exception. It, you yeah, hear yeah. you hear of one data set that somehow disappeared, or one set of media that accidentally was unreadable, and then that that gets projected to the the, the whole world. When the reality is, is we have um, what's beyond whatever is beyond petabytes worth of piles of stuff yeah. sitting there waiting. And, and you know what's at the heart of those horror stories, no. it's usually a human error. It's not usually a technical failure. It's usually a human error. And if it's not a human error, it's an economic problem. Right. Um, and you guys wouldn't have heard of this because this was a British thing. Um, um, the um, Doomsday Project, right. the BBC Doomsday Project, okay? Um, 1980s, what year would it have been? I'm trying to think what, how old I was. Um, Early. 
early 80s, very early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, they had the idea, the BBC had the idea. Oh, well, it would have been, um, it would have been uh, 89. Yeah. Because 1089 was when the doomsday, it was, it was to celebrate the anniversary of Doomsday Book. They created a database of information that was crowdsourced from the whole of the UK. And the idea was they were going to put it on a video disc with a video disc player. They're going to have their new BBC Micro, which was the latest piece of consumer uh, computer kit available in the UK. And this, this stuff was, they were going to have one of these in every classroom in the country. Um, they built it. If you look at the software on it, amazing for its age. They invented hypertext on this thing in an eight bit computer. It's just phenomenal. How much did it cost? Cost the same as a new car. There was no way that there was gonna be, there was like one, in a one per town if you were lucky, died a death and became a preservation problem. And it's the story that's told about digital preservation. But it's, 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 not, it's, the it's not the story. It's not really the story. Um, it was an economic problem. They just got the price wrong. And they, but the ambition, the concept was phenomenal. And then some years later, they went back and they did it again. And I partnered with them on it from National Archives in the UK. And we built a website uh, they built a website of some of the data, and then we preserved that in our web archive. And that is now properly preserved because we thought they, they and we thought about it ahead of time. The um, the access side of it, um, the three words that I'll I'll, I'll explain are um, lists, um, uh, fear, and I just thought the third word went out of my mind, but I'll I'll remember it. Um, um, Oh, motivation. The, um, the, the, the lists that Tim's talking about are the key and the iterative lists um, for action um, be, because um, it, you, need, you need something. I mean, d dummy numbers of digital files don't get us anywhere, but one more piece of information gets you somewhere. Mm -hmm. Two more pieces of information yep. get you twice as far as yep. you were Absolutely. when you had one piece of information. So um, and some, at least with the AV stuff, a lot of that is just derived, there's derived and assigned. So the derived um, information is, is associated with the, with the source material, whether yeah. it's born digital or not. But I'm thinking of audiovisual again. Yeah. There's always, almost all, you always find the tape that doesn't have any information on it. And if you let that drive yourself, then you're driving by exception. But more often than not, there's something. And so you make lists. Yeah. Um, then the, um, and then make, make the um, information um available um in an open and accessible way and this is where the fear word comes in um and it's it, in i'm talking tomorrow a bit about about copyright and intellectual property but essentially on a worldwide level the um the um intellectual property regime is broken and um so the issue for us is how much are we going to succumb to the broken system um we can't fix it it's not in our domain to fix it it is our domain to recognize that it's broken. And then the question becomes one of, of risk. And universities are really conservative. General counsels are really conservative. Uh, deans of libraries are a little less, but still conservative, all the way down the pike. Uh, the people that want to just get the job done are in the lower levels, spinning this, these disks up. It's like, let's let this stuff go. So I think that we've gotten, it's beyond copyright. It's really about uh, taking... Um, our responsibilities as um, as givers of of culture um, seriously and put that uh, help that to overcome fear, but it's going to take a lot of people to risk to take risks that they're not comfortable risking. And then my third piece of it is that the 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 out there of overcoming fear combined with the lists is I'm back to my generating demand. Uh, we have no nobody has any attention whatsoever. Um, so you you have to grab people's attention in order for somebody to even realize that they want to put in any effort. The, the user studies that I did several decades ago, though, showed, at least with cultural heritage organizations, that people will put in the work if they're motivated. It, um, I developed at the National Archives, they still use it in Washington, the, the one card theory, which is, is that if you, users will be satisfied, is if you can give them 
a high probability of likelihood that what they want is on that cart, whether it's four carts or six carts or uh, an entire building mm -hmm. full. Mm -hmm. that whatever the, the unit of likelihood, if you can present the unit of likelihood, um, you, people will do the work to get the work done. The problem with the digital world is we, we, we have no patience for a millisecond of delay and Google has spoiled us to mm -hmm. rank choice, even though we know that the ranked choices are leave um, a, a diversity and equity and inclusion out in the cold, et cetera. So um, I think that what we're doing is we have to engineer patience. That was the word out, not motivation. Mm -hmm. So it's it's overcome fear, um, make the lists and and um, and engineer patience. And that's we don't want to be stereotyped as librarians saying, shh, now just take your time and it's there someplace. But it, we sort of have to get into a mode of, of engineering um, people's diligence and patience. And, and uh, it pays off. It always pays off. Absolutely. I think there might be more patients out there yeah. than, than we, than we mm -hmm. sometimes imagine, though. Right. Um, some of the most exciting stuff in the archive space that I'm aware of, particularly in the our access space, has been uh, through crowdsourcing mm -hmm. and through um, motivated individuals who 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 care about something specific. It could be something incredibly geeky, but they care enough about it that they will invest their patients. Yeah, and then you can spin off that. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK genealogical space, it was something called Free BMD. The UK, the UK uh, birth marriage and registration system didn't do, didn't put stuff online and it didn't list, list everything in a helpful way. So these people got together and they created a database of every birth, yeah. marriage and death in the whole of the UK. And they just did it by hand. They came up with all their protocols, it was completely self-built and it transformed the genealogical space. Overnight. All, all the crowdsourcing is based on that idea too. Yeah, the absolutely. Uh, um, and the fan, the fan sites, which Zooniverse. we tend to not take as serious, but there's a site for there's a website for everything. Um, absolutely. And, and there's at least one, and sometimes dozens of people behind that yep. site. All the radio stuff we were talking about today. It's oh yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. So we need to we can tap that. We've been we've appropriately been laser focused on our students, on the faculty that. Um, uh, that do the work that we want to support and the scholarly communities and to a certain extent the administrators that run the place when they have a question and it but that forces us to be insular yeah. in in our and thinking that it's only us i worked at duke for five years and it was always about duke the minute that i wanted to um uh, like try a collaboration where we would do something that someone else was doing well it's it, how is this about duke I shouldn't have named Duke specifically because somebody is probably watching from Duke, and I'm sorry if that's the case. But uh, but, but it's it's that way. It's, it's okay if they're watching. It's it's that way everywhere. Uh, and so, but I think the whole not, you back to partnership and, and collaboration. There's exactly. a lot of ideas out there, and they don't all come out of the academy. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's where the partnership comes in. That's what's and it's radical partnership. It's not so there is partnering with the big guys completely because they've got capabilities that nobody else has got. But there's also partnering with lots of little guys. Yeah. Because if you do that, and, you get the power of crowd. And, and you just have really to recognize. Good. Yeah, that. absolutely. It's just an acknowledgement. Well, and that, that gets two themes to pull out of what you're just talking about. I mean, talking about scale. Yeah. Yeah. And, and something that's been an answer in every single one of the questions has been the economics. Mm. And one of the things that at the AWS conference was talked about last week was we have produced over 120 zettabytes of information last year. That's a, that's two up from PETA. Yeah. And it's <laughs> just thank you. it's just moving astronomically fast on how much. And as librarians and archivists and people focused on digital preservation, I always see this as a five, 10 year problem that we're inheriting down the road of like, mm -hmm. that's the scale that we have to work at. Yeah. Which 20 years ago, when somebody said you're going to have to preserve a petabyte, it seemed impossible and it completely is doable now. Absolutely. So what are some strategies that you have in mind of this. thinking at that scale in this present, but for your, for 
archives futures? You go first. I, yeah, huh? um, I, I, it's a great question, but the answer is to completely flip the script and to ask the question, what would it cost us if nothing? If if these what's petabyte exabyte exabyte okay if these exabytes and plus um, just all of a sudden disappeared, um, maybe a natural disaster. Um, uh, what would be the recovery? What would be the cost to individuals, groups, communities, society, etc., all the way up? If all of this stuff just disappeared, there there are answers where that would really really be costly. But there are other answers where it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't really matter. I mean, it, I, I, the genealogy one you brought up, I, mm. and I, I'm a genealogist myself, and I've loved, mm. um, I've been doing it for decades. But you know, if if ancestry and 23andMe disappeared tomorrow, it, it would we would have some crimes we wouldn't solve. So we have to think about how the our own data is being manipulated and used by us for. Hmm. for crime solving but but even that at, at, at some level i think there's an awful lot Gover the government records that our store the national archives is now require our national archives is required to bring in um with a certain time frame uh, they agencies have to produce and the archives has to accession now dig born digital records and uh, my first thought is why do we do we really what what's the cost and I'm an arch archivist by training. I, I, I learned to love the archival record. But the other side of it is, is that maybe our commitment to save, we have to think about what it means to commit. And I'm not convinced that society is lost by, if YouTube disappeared. I mean, would we be worse off? Um, as a as a as a people, would we figure out other I'm ways? Not be able to mend make mend my mend my fridge when it goes wrong. <laughs> True. Or 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 or, True. Fi or fix my washing. And maybe machine. that wasn't. And, and so and so oh, maybe but, but, instruction but, manuals but, but, and dictionary. I mean, dictionaries. There's no published dictionary. So, but if all the dictionaries in the world died, well, maybe we would uh, be be uh, impoverished. But I'm I'm just playing the game because we all, it always goes the other way, and then it ends up economics and technical. Instead of like, well, it's okay if we use the delete key here. Who's going to use the delete key? I guess is the question. I think I'm going to. I think the answer is both. Yeah. Right? Truth, truthful answer. I'm just is being, both. I'm mostly I, being rhetorical. I, I, no, absolutely, and 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 I love that. Um, there are some things, um, and I got into this a little bit. Um, actually, we got into it in the pandemic, because at the time I was working in a government institution. And when you have to shut down a government institution and you have three days to do it in, mm -hmm. okay, and it, and it's shut down. It's not, it's not kind of like, oh, well, we'll cope. It's like everybody goes home, nothing happens. Right. Okay. Then you have to really ask yourself, what breaks in society when that happens for every single government institution? And funny things funny things break it's not what you expect to break so it turned out that the biggest thing that broke in scotland for the national records of scotland where i was working national records of scotland did something called um passing acts of parliament under the great seal okay well that means is there's a metal matrix and some and some beeswax and somebody does that to a piece of um, fancy paper with this with a thing on it but it turns out that until that wax has set, that is not a law. It just isn't, right? It doesn't matter what you do, it isn't a law. And since that was what the National Archive and National Records of Scotland did, that single service had to keep going because otherwise Parliament couldn't pass the COVID acts that it had to pass in order to govern the country. <laughs> Loads of other stuff could just shut down. Stuff we thought was vital, like keeping the archival stuff, keeping all this. Now nah, we can sure that we can switch that off for six months. Nobody will notice. Wax seals. But it turned out the wax seals was the thing that broke the country. Oh, the other thing that broke the country was um, not being able to get the land titles because you couldn't sell your house. If you can't, if you don't know what the land title is, you can't sell your house. And if you can't sell your house, all those, um, all those lawyers, all those. Um, 
related realtors and all these other people, they can't work. So you've just taken this huge piece of the economy and you've switched it off. Probably quite important you keep access to your land titles. <laughs> Um, so there are some there are some surprising things in government in the government world that turn out to be vitally important that you keep. Right. But equally, there's gazillions of stuff you're quite absolutely correct that you can throw away. Um, and it's a thing like a pandemic that forces you to to find those. Um, and 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 we did. And um, and I suspect, even though I've left there now, that they're still using those that knowledge and that information of that of of that hard hard lesson to inform to inform their work going forward i mean but in terms of um yeah i mean yes so yes it, it, the, the simple answer to your question is where we are right now it is economics and um maybe it won't be um in a bit if we if um if economics fails us or if the scale fails us but it won't probably won't be because of our own doing it, it it's i yeah i see um unsustainability and dis, uh, yeah and, climate, and climate disasters change and sustainability and, and things yeah. will be the thing that will stop it yeah. uh, i i get i get quite surprised uh, it's a the it industry are very good at telling us how many bits we use yeah. right they're very very good at telling us we've used however many zettabytes it was right fine um we're going to run out of discs really are we really going to run out of discs or are we just going to stop making some bits it'll be one or the other and i'll put my money on and stop making the bits if we truly do run out of discs because what will happen is the price will go up and it will cost so much to store that people will just stop making the bits we're never going to run out of space it's just going to the space is going to get more expensive and so we'll stop needing it it, it, it it's economics it's supply and demand i'm afraid well, one avenue this conversation frequently goes down is we need to work better together to solve this, but it only changes incrementally and project based. And like, there are great examples of this with like Smithsonian's cultural heritage projects that they've done, but it, it doesn't ever seem like, and, and we, we'll do it by country, you know, like a Royal archives or national archives will do this, but yeah how do, how do we grow it to another level or should we and the system's perfectly fine like is that conversation of a broader collaboration towards preserving cultural memory a worthwhile conversation short sure answer yes completely worthwhile and there are institutions out that are already having that conversation so uh, unesco memory of the world the united nations is having that conversation and it's been having that conversation for 10, 15 years, maybe. I'm not sure of the exact history of that program. Absolutely, it's worth having. Um, tiny little institution that some people here will have heard of. I know John's heard of it because I've bent his ear on the subject. Is a small institution based in Glasgow in the UK called the Digital Preservation Coalition. It employs 10 people. Those 10 people have had more impact in the, in the preservation of cultural heritage globally than any 10 people, other 10 people I can think of. Because what they do is they truly bring together a community of people who care about this stuff across borders. And by doing so, they transfer information, they transfer skills through that community so that the world, not to put too, you know, a bigger thing on it, the world improves its, its capability. And it changes the narrative. The narratives start to happen in parliaments because countries, because people lobby based on the experience of other people lobbying. And so those, so bit by bit, it is incremental, but bit by bit, it, it improves. The world gets better. I'm going to take a contrary view just to go ahead, just to push things a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, if collaboration means another meeting, then I'd say no. We don't need any more collaboration. <laughs> and I'm I'm only partly being cynical because what the one of the issues with the DPC and um, the Council of Library and Information Resources mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. these uh, other groups that are fostering collaboration is they produce product that is shareable, and um, I I think um, the, the, there's a reluctance. I mean I think it goes all the way down into the system. They 
the, the ability, uh, the willingness of a systems developer to put out there what their, how their system is designed or what it's supposed mm. to do. Uh, we were talking today about just like having the, having the documentation of your, your processes and procedures um, readily and openly available so that others can find it. DPC does that in spades, so does, yes. uh, so does Clear. So it's not so much about, uh, we always think of collaboration as yet another meeting. And or an international conference, and now they're hybrid. But that isn't. It's the products that come out, and that can be done. Uh, that's a kind of a, a modus operandi, um, which we yes. aren't often don't do too well. Um, and yeah. some of it is just um, institutional feelings. Either that um, I don't feel like taking the time and dedicating the resources to documenting what we're doing for others to see. Or um, we're not worthy. We're just doing what everybody else is doing. But it turns out that's not so true. It's if you can if you can find yeah. what someone else is doing, you've got a problem. And if you can nowadays, you can, if you can search and find a solution, you don't have to have another meeting. It's still collaboration. Absolutely. So it's a lot of it is in the product uh, work, which we're not. We we could do a whole lot more of. I think you're right. Um, some of the most foresightful and in, and. Uh, impressive acts of digital preservation that I'm aware of that, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to the UK, but that's my, used to be my world, um, that had happened in the UK, happened in minute institutions where one person had a really smart idea and just kind of went, do you know what? There's nobody up there telling me not to do this. I'm just going to bloody well do it. Okay. Um, there are a couple of people, um, can I remember? Uh, there's a guy called Viv who works in uh, Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire Archives, and I'll name check him. Um, uh, and, and he does phenomenal work all on his own, virtually. But he's, he is in producing the systems, little systems, little tools yeah. that he's produced. He solved lots of archives problems for them. But because of institutions like the DPC, that pass on the news that that thing exists, right. product, absolutely, right. then other people benefit. And that's what we need to, that's what we need to engender um, across our institutions. Yeah. But, but it isn't, greatest respect to Vanderbilt and all the big universities, it's not up here, guys. The real stuff is down here in these little institutions where people have got real nitty gritty problems that they have to solve that aren't highfalutin scholarship and all right. that, well, it, which is important, don't get me wrong, but. Well, let's let's bring this full circle before we open up for questions. And, and this goes back to what you were talking about at the beginning, Paul, in we have to embrace a continuous state of discomfort and learning. Yes. And so what do we say to the born digital archivists out there, the people who are starting building a new collection, people who have inherited an AV collection, how do you both start it and tap into a network so that you can both preserve it, but also preserve it in a broad for a for a broader society where it's both going to be preserved in perpetuity and described over time? Is this how do you start? Yeah, like where yeah. where where what would be the entry point? That's a good question. Well, I'm gonna, Sorry. I'm gonna bang my own drum. I'm gonna say Google parsimonious preservation. Because if you do, though I say it myself, you will find something that you can use. I hope, that's why I wrote it. Um, it's designed to be used by people. It, the, the concept was to just use what you have. Remember, three, two, one, three copies, two risk environments, one offline. Yeah, the, the, the actual core of this stuff is simple. Don't be frightened by, don't be scared by the big thing out there and just have a go. Because, so there's two, if you don't do anything, the stuff's gonna rot. If you do something, the worst you can do is do something and get it wrong, in which case the stuff's going to rot anyway. But if you do something and even get it half right, you've done something that's better than doing nothing. So just do something. And, and I would 
I, I completely agree with what you said, but then I, I shift to the relentless hierarchies of bureaucrats, bureaucracies, no matter how large or small. And it's like, mm -hmm. who's gonna start and where are you going to start? Because often the motivation comes from seven layers down in the, uh, in the seven layer dip. And so um, you, they're, they're, all the organizations I've ever encountered in libraries and archives, there's always really smart people. And there's always, nowadays it's easy to stay plugged in. And then, but then somebody asks the question, what are you doing? Or at the end of the year in the in the annual evaluation cycle, it's like you have to sort of report your accomplishments. And there aren't any this year because all I did was worry for a year and think and learn about how this organization, seven layers above me, is going to support something. So there's a there's a kind of an an, an environment of stasis. Mm. Um, even in the face of technical abilities, we, we yeah, know yeah. what yeah, to do absolutely. now. Um, and even we can even price it out yeah. um, to a certain extent. And we can yeah. even project the, the, the economies of scale on various assumptions going, going out. And then somebody has to do something. And it's usually the person that wants to do something is too far down in the food chain um, to, to either feel effective or feel supported. Um, in every organization I've worked, there's been brilliant people seven layers down. And it's like, how do, what about the layers one, two, and three? And that's usually, I'm not talking about the buck above you. It's, 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 is it Vanderbilt's mission to build repositories for petabyte bytes of data that may or may not benefit even Vanderbilt? How do you have that conversation? And um, because once the somebody upstairs says, yeah, this is this is definitely mission critical. The financial system is mission critical. The online catalog is mission critical. Um, the, um, the, the, the development officer's database is mission critical. What about the, um, the, the petabytes of yeah. images from special collections? Is it mission critical? And the minute somebody says yes to you, then the ball rolls and there's talent collaboration and everything else. But I think the problem yeah. is at the top uh, or even above the top. Yeah. These presidents talk to each other and then they talk to people, trustees. It's, and, about, getting, it's about getting the narrative. It's about getting the narrative. It's the, na the, narrative, the narrative, right? And it has to be simple because nobody has more than 30 seconds to concentrate on anything Yeah. Um, at all. So um, we, we're not quite there on the sound bites. And no. We're not quite there on institutional, individual, isolated in, uh, institutions benefiting the, the common good, because the common good has gone down the toilet with lots of other things that have, has happened over the years. Yeah. And so we still stand for the common good, but we're, we're fighting against an, a notion that maybe there isn't such a thing as the common good anymore. So it's really big things like that that I think are much more problematical for our long-term future than finding a really smart person to take the bull by the horns and do something because there are lots of those people out there uh, ready to go yeah yeah um, uh, right probably some right here in the room here uh, definitely you know. but it, it requires very that. top <laughs> the 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 at michigan our, our biggest donor is stephen m ross who owns the um the miami dolphins and he built the school of business up and then it wasn't good enough so he doubled the money he gave 500 million and then he rebuilt the stadium so when Stephen M. Ross says Michigan needs to be in the forefront of saving the world's fill in the blank, then it'll happen. And I hate to be quite so hierarchical, but right now it, it just seems everything turns around um, institutions chasing the dollar or the pound or the lira and um, waiting for the, the talent is here. There's the, the message here is, uh, is that in this room and um, spread out all over the place is the knowledge and the talent mm -hmm. and even some of the collaboration that's happening informally, but with the will is a whole nother matter. Yeah. And um, that's a tough one. I don't know, you know it's your job maybe. Yeah. yeah. Sound, bite. Sound bites. Yeah. Let's turn to the room for a couple of questions. Do we have any online? Uh, not yet. Okay. Not yet, all right. Let's let's do the room and then we'll do one online. Okay. If you don't ask any, I'm going to ask you more. Yeah. 
No one's making eye contact with me. All right, Jim is here. Here, Jim, I'll come over with the mic. Yeah, Paul, this is just a question about, I really like the idea of uh, the notion of using the collections as entertainment. And I completely mm -hmm. agree. Thought you'd, I would just like you to muse on that some more and just talk more about what we might be able to do just to have fun with these collections and make it more just for the enjoyment of it. Yeah. Um, um, I, it was a throwaway line from this morning, and I um, largely because so much of this audiovisual material brings puts a smile on mm -hmm. anybody's face who uh, even begins to encounter it. Um, old television programs, um, radio shows, uh, photos, etc. So I, I was riffing on trying to grasp the 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 entertainment value of this material. The 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 um, I I I think we can have more fun um, with how we. Um, Promote. I mean, there's only so many lists, search lists that we can oh. then could produce. So maybe it's um, well, my one first suggestion is to possibly rethink what it means for us to exhibit or to promote or to tell our story yep. and to use the only the fun stuff to tell the story, um, not the dry academic yep. latest a uh, scholarly publication, which we also need, uh, being one of those people, we still have to promote them. So there's that. But then um, the, the uh, and, and this is where I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm gonna be a little bit controversial, but there's this automatic tension right now with fun between those who commercialize it and those who are determined um, to make the fun be free. And I think we have to find our way through that thicket. I, it may mean selling more stuff. It may mean allying ourselves with HBO or making sure that some of our television programs get into some series that only people watch after midnight, um, et cetera. So um, th I think there's room yeah. there's there's room for partnerships that that might not be um, that might not feel like we're soiling ourselves to <laughs> to promote, uh, but it might mean income, and we might have to be willing to like make money a little bit Got here it. and still keep our souls and also still keep our commitment to free and open access. I think they're not, hopefully not utterly incompatible, but it feels like that's a big one. Um, the minute you have something really fun, somebody wants to buy it and lock it up behind a paywall. Um, it's happening. It happened at Yale when I was there and it's had, we, I've had five inquiries about music time in Africa about producing a kind of, um, um, like Anders, Alexander Street type thing. They buy up your resources and then they license them back to the very people that you bought them from. Um, we may have to like take a deep breath and do some of that stuff. Um, some of the national archives around the world have taken that deep breath and I some know. of their stuff. And they are sometimes that people look down their noses at them. Yeah. Um, having worked in one of those institutions, yeah. I can tell you that there is I can't calculate the number of more material that is now available as a result of yes. having having taken those decisions. Right. Uh, I can guarantee you that that a tenth of that material right. would never have made it out of right. would never have made it out of the archive the, the, without the, the those genealogical material. Exactly. Without down. those deals, it, it just would not have happened. And Alexander Street is doing wonderful things in a way, but it's I, I, I don't know Alexander yeah. Street, but 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 yeah. okay. Yes, it is a case of holding your nose, but but the benefit pays for it. the benefit really does work it does pay off all right and now we have our one rapid fire question with the last minute so we have a question from rogers hall on the zoom what is a reasonable scale effort finances for a social sciences investigator to collaborate with university archivists particularly if these collaborations will involve gathering and digitizing material g aspects of citizen social slash science uh, is it a question of scale? Yes. Oh. What's the what's the minimum viable? So yeah. I'm going to interpret that as the uh, and just check. Are you asking what is the minimum viable project project size? Is that is that the is that the is that kind of the question? You know what's what's the smallest that would work? Hmm. When is it worthwhile? That's essentially like when, when is it when when to do it? 
Like, I went to do it. Like, what is the scale of a project? Like, I have five VHS tapes. Do I engage the team or do I do it myself? Ah, oh, oh, right. Okay. Mm. Or that's my um, my simple least. answer is pretty large and large enough to have an impact beyond your own fetish. Um, there, yeah. There's a lot of a lot, of, and I, I work a lot yeah. with anthropologists uh, who do work in in Africa, and they all have uh, file cabinet drawers full of cassette tapes and videotapes that they brought back and every single one of them would like to uh, to be digitized and turn over to the library and it and it, it went uh, when you poke at it a little bit it's um a, it's a passion project so the minute i think it gets beyond can get beyond it it can be sold as something other than a passion project um yes. i.e it's going to mean something to somebody else other than me then i think it should bite yeah i think it should happen yeah i think i, I agree yeah, I think I think that's absolutely perfect. Thank you again, Paul and Tim. This has been great. Thank you. And, and catch them after this. Thank you, folks, in, in person and online. Really appreciate it. And yeah. we have more events tomorrow. Good. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.